another lady forward, Sue Volt. Sue is going to tell you of her experiences, how it occurred, and again, make sure you ask the questions. Don't leave here not asking the questions of those you really want to know more about. Sue, if you would, please. Thank you. Well, my experiences started when I was very, very young. I was four years old, um, 1961, and I was in an operating room. And the first thing I recall is being up on the ceiling, watching them in the operating room, and seeing them way back then with the thick cotton masks that they wore in those days, not like the disposable ones they have today, and the cotton caps, and seeing the green and black subway tiles that were on the walls in that operating room, and the glass cases that were actually all along one wall in that room. And I was there to have my tonsils out, but yet I was above the whole the whole operating table, looking down, and just like others today have mentioned, I was looking down at this little girl and thinking, oh, that's interesting. Look at what they're doing down there. Mm, that's fascinating. And while I was having that thought of how, oh, isn't that fascinating, all of a sudden there was this brilliant white light and this warmth, and it was just so welcoming and so loving and this voice which was male that said you're home and I immediately said I can't be home I have to go home and take care of my little brother and the voice said to me no it's okay your brother will be fine and I said no I have to go take care of my little brother and the voice said, no, you're fine. This is where, you, where you're going to stay. You, you're home. And I said, no, no, I like it here, but I have to go take care of my little brother. And I was really vehement that I was going to go back and take care of my little brother, who was 18 months younger than I was. So the next thing I knew, I went back. And that was the end of my first NDE experience and about so after I came out of the uh, operating room my mom was a nurse and I told her about it and um, like I think just about everybody else here I was being raised in a quote good Catholic family <laughs> and uh, she told me oh you can't tell anybody about that that never happened you're crazy you know, you can't ever tell anyone about that. So I never did after that day. And um, about two years later, uh, I saw my very first in-ground swimming pool and was invited to go swimming in it. And when I did, I started swimming from the shallow end and I was gonna make it all the way to the far end because it was fun. I'd done a lot of swimming at the lake where our family had a cottage. I knew how to swim. So I just struck out and started swimming, and I was having a ball. It was wonderful. So I'm swimming and swimming and swimming, and then the next thing I knew, the bright light was there, and I was home again. And this time, darn it, I was going to stay, because I knew this bright light, and I knew how wonderful this was, and I was staying this time. And shucks. Next thing I knew, I was on the concrete on the side of that pool and spewing out water, and how the heck did I end up there? I wanted to stay this time. This time I was smart enough to know I wanted to stay, because it wasn't much fun back on Earth. But no, I didn't get, a chance to, didn't get a chance to say I wanted to stay this time. So I was back here on Earth. So all right, I was here. And I was seven, and oh well, life wasn't much fun, that's for darn sure, so I stayed. And, you know, things progressed, and they weren't too darn much fun. And uh, life went on, and there was incest in my family, and, um, you know, it wasn't an easy road. And when I was 
approximately 23, I had two young children who were, um, well, I guess I was a little bit younger than that, but I had two very young children and um, was very ill. And all of a sudden, one afternoon, one afternoon um, couldn't take care of my children because I was too ill and couldn't go to a family wedding because I was too ill and my children were being taken care of by someone else. I was home alone um, and I was, because of the experiences I had had when I was very young, I had felt part of my mission, I think, without realizing it, but I think part of my mission had been always to kind of teach my parents to be a little kinder, to be a little, um, a little, a little more welcoming of people who were different than we were. I had tried with all my might at nine years old to get them to go to hear Martin Luther King talk when he gave his I Have a Dream speech. And of course, that never happened, but I tried with all my might. <laughs> even though it didn't work, um, you know, and, and had tried through the years to, to bring some kindness into that world. And when I was so ill and had these young children, and I had always had faith, faith had always brought me through because I'd had grandparents, two sets of grandparents who were very faith-filled and a great aunt and a great uncle who were very faith-filled, and the six of them had given me what I needed to really make it through in a very harsh environment. And so my faith had really kept me going through the years. But by that day, I was very questioning, and I had said, you know, Lord, if I can't take care of my children, then what's the use of me being here? And I was really having a real questioning that day all by myself. I couldn't get out of bed by myself, couldn't take care of myself, couldn't take care of my children, couldn't take care of my home, and was very, very ill and said, Lord, if there's a purpose for me being here, then please show me what it is. But if there isn't, please take me now so that my children have a chance of my husband remarrying and them having a stepmother who'll be good to them. And what happened then was a three-hour experience that, you know, will never leave me. And at that point in time, um, I was transported to a place that appeared to be the side of a stream, a very verdant stream, and those of you who are familiar with the 23rd Psalm, it just appeared to be the place of the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. And you are by that stream. And there was the image of God there. And God and I were by that stream for three hours talking. And there was the light. There was the tunnel, the whole thing getting there. And um, over the years, putting all those pieces of all my three experiences together, I think I've come to realize that, or come to hypothesize, I guess I should say, that each of us is connected to the source, what I choose to call God now, the source, that I think we all have the message that I've been given in my mission is to tell us all that we all come from that divine spark. We all have part of that divinity within us. And that each of us, the best of us and the worst of us, on the face of this earth at any given point in time, all has part of that divinity within us. And that we are all interconnected and that we all come from love, and that love is what is going to make us all survive, and that forgiveness is all part of that love. 
joy is part of that love. Um, the biggest road that I have walked is forgiving the person who created the incest in my life and taking care of him the last five years of his life. And it gave both of us the biggest joy ever. Um, and, you know, it was a very, very, very unusual situation. I had many, many therapists tell me this person would never admit what he had done, that it would be a one in a billion shot. And he did. And it was a miraculous thing to have happen. And, you know, I think that was part of my path here and part of my mission to learn, you know, about forgiveness and, and to be able to talk about forgiveness and to be able to talk about the importance of love and the reality of how important love is and, and the divine spark that each of us has that we need to find within ourselves and to, to bring forth. And I think that's part of the mission that I've been given as I've come back from my experiences. <laughs>